uh, looking for America. The truth about that photo is that it, I thought Steve looked good looking through a telescope, and I wanted him. I wanted a photo, a photo of Steve looking through the telescope. So I made him look through the telescope, and I took pictures of him. And I did look good. Yeah. You did look good. Yeah. But then how did I end up? How did we end up doing that? I, I, I made you do it. I was uncomfortable looking through the telescope, so I figured, well, it's only fair that you look through the telescope too. And I take your picture. Huh? Right, and that's what happened. Yeah. And this was taken with a disposable camera, like our most of our stuff? I believe it was, yeah. And then afterwards came the title, Looking for America. And the two things came together. I'm trying to show how arbitrary it is. You don't, you don't say, let's have an album called Looking for America, and let's take a picture for the cover of me looking through a telescope, which means it's America to me has got much less meaning than it used to have, and I'm less approved. I, I approve of it less than I used to. And you have to look through a telescope to see the good parts. <laughs> yep. But that was all different things. It just got put together at the end. Um, I'm trying to think if the music was the same. Uh, the national anthem, I think, had been written before. Uh -huh. um, Fast Lane was written for a saxophone player. Uh, Christoph, Christoph Lauer, Lauer. Yeah. yeah. I thought so. That was written yeah. for him because that was written for a, a radio recording somewhere in Germany, and I, he was involved, and so I wrote a piece. I thought it was so fast he couldn't play it, and he played it he very played well. it effortlessly, So yeah, it became a sort of joke. Well, here's this tune Christoph couldn't possibly play. Uh, Old MacDonald, it's all put together sort of arbitrarily. It's... It's like you make breakfast, so you see how much kind of fruit you have in the refrigerator. You don't every morning have strawberries and cream. Uh, and this album, if I'm asked to say something about it, I would just say that at the time I was feeling, it was before Donald Trump, can you believe that? Well before Donald Trump. And I was already complaining. <laughs> Good. I don't know. I'm, I don't know who the president. Maybe it was Bush. <laughs> could have been. Could have been. I was making uh, a political statement. Younger, That's yeah. true, and I was just combining whatever was in the refrigerator, and it turned out to be. I remember looking for songs that. I think I'm an American writer, composer, songwriter. I think I write things that have to do with this country that I live in. And uh, although Fastlane would be just as, com just as, forget that thought. Yeah, I still, I still, I think there's, there is something in, in your melodies and everything that are American. Yeah, I feel very American. Uh, not that I'm proud of it, I just feel very American, whatever it is. It's very difficult to be proud of it these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and remember with the phrase, the ugly American? Mm -hmm. I thought to myself, my God, am I an ugly American? <laughs> what can I do about that? And I guess I tried to be better in many ways, uh, not to be that person who goes to Europe and can't speak the languages and just gets paid to like perform like like a like a a bear mm -hmm. in a circus i think a lot of musicians felt that way we were just 
that was our ugliness. But it wasn't that ugly. We didn't shoot anybody. <laughs> we didn't, we <laughs> nobody, yeah. nobody died because of us unless they were listening to a tune and got so carried away that they hit another car <laughs> while they were driving. That's happened. Some people pull over, though. If it's a really good song, they, they pull over and listen until it's over. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking silly. You, you take over, Steve. Would you, would you consider a sequel? How would you approach this same uh, concept today? Well, on the new album, mm -hmm. there is a whole tune dedicated to Donald Trump. And it's called Beautiful Telephones. Um, so I'm still doing it. I'm still criticizing the leadership of the country. And there was an album that preceded the Looking for America album. It was when Reagan got elected. I remember that night being on the bus on the road, going toward Paris, and they, the radio said that Reagan was elected. And I remember writing a, an arrangement of the Star Spangled Banner, but it was in minor instead of major, you know, something like that. So I was already criticizing. And through Charlie Hayden, I learned to, to, to question my American beliefs. Like, I liked John Kennedy. I thought he was wonderful. And Charlie said, he was not. Bay of Pigs. You know, and I thought, oh, gee, I, I kind of think as an American of do I have this belief because I live in this country? What if I lived in another country? Would I have a different belief? But I think right now we're getting so global. The last song, the song I'm working on right now is a song called Palestinian Blue and it's in 7-4 and it's all Middle Eastern melodies and because I'm quite concerned about the Middle East, and in particular, the problems Palestine is having with Israel. And although I, I think is, Israel is great too, I might write a song about that next, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm more commenting than criticizing. And um, this is just one of, the, one of the areas where I tend to comment a lot of politics politics in general. Uh, and Manfred lets me do whatever I want to do, or he did, until the last three records. He, he lived through my entire quite quiet storm period, which Steve was influential on. In fact, there's a picture of you on that cover. I know. <laughs> Looking good, I might add. That's called Night Glow, and um, yeah. Um, Manfred was horrified, I assume. I mean, I know, I could tell that he was horrified, but he did it, he put it out anyway. He didn't say, oh, we don't do records like that. They're, we don't have, uh, what do you call the fade out thing on a record? Fades, board fades. Board fades. Yeah, board. He, uh, he let me do anything I wanted to do and never once let it be known, except to me, that I knew without being told that he was horrified. Um, he did everything. And then when I got to the stage where I was not making records for my own label anymore and had stopped working with the big band because it was too expensive, I started, I said, Manfred said, well, where's your next album? You're not, you don't have a label anymore. What are you doing? Why? I said, I can't afford to make an album. I, uh, he said, well, I'll put it out. I said, okay. And that was it. It was not a business meeting. We were just together in a dressing room somewhere. He said, I'll put it out. I said, okay. And so I thought, wow, this is the first time in my life. How old could I have been by then? 60s. In my 60s, no, my 70s. 70s, 70s. In my 70s, yeah. I got my first record deal. 
But luck, <laughs> luckily, it was for a seat. It could have been. What if it was for? Yeah, I know. I can't even think of a name of a horrible person. We don't even know the. We don't you know, know who they are. We don't know those people anymore. Yeah, but anyway, then I then I decided. Well, he always let me do what I wanted to do, and now I'm going to let him do what um, he wants to do. I don't even remember thinking. It's not the way my mind works. I just did it without thinking. It doesn't pass through that part of the brain that thinks. It just. I just felt, well, I could say I felt that it would be interesting, particularly to me, to do whatever he said, just as a joke almost, or as a trial, as an experiment. What if I hated that note and I let him not change it because what we do in the studio is we just play the music and then if there's a mistake it, we live with it or if it's really horrible he'll let us there was one note once and I say one note because Steve told you that I am very particular about <laughs> each note and uh, one note in a piece that I could not bear because it was a accompaniment. It wasn't a solo. It was I was playing a figure behind a bass solo, and it was uh, on the girl who cried champagne. And B flat is the bass note, and then you play the harmony notes. And this is something that goes on for five, ten minutes. And I'm the bass player, and I got one note B natural instead of B flat. And I said, Manfred, please. And he said, well, it's already been mixed. It's already been pro practically packaged. And I said, I can't live with that note. And he said, oh, all right. <laughs> so he let me have it. We changed that note from B to B flat. My finger just, it wasn't my brain that made a mistake. It, it was, was my this, finger this slipped. This little villain. This the, thing. the little finger. <laughs> I don't have a lot of control over it. <laughs> it does what it wants to do it's too. It's a slippery little devil. Yeah. But um, from that point, I thought the first album turned out that we did for Manfred called Trios mm -hmm. turned out great. I didn't spend months deciding about which note it was going to be. I didn't think about which tunes we were going to play. We just went into the studio and I sat there and he said, you know a tune I always loved? Vashkar. I said, oh, we have an arrangement of that. So I took it out and we played it and it sounded great. And then I, I said, well, maybe we should play. And then I tried something else and I knew he didn't like it. He didn't say he didn't like it. He just let me know without language. He didn't like it. So we didn't, we skipped that tune. We didn't try to play it better and went to the next tune. So in other words, he chose every tune on the album. It was that much control. And I thought, oh man, this is, this is a lot of fun. I don't have to ever worry. <laughs> I, I could just say, and what shall I put on the cover? And he chose the cover totally. He chose the photographer. He wrote, he told me what, he told me everything. And I thought it was, although it may never last, I thought, I mean, you know, that would not that was not a new re regime, but uh, it worked out great. I really enjoyed it. And the next album, so we did it again. Andando was the next. But that one, I had all the music uh, chosen, written in advance. I knew what the tunes were. I didn't know what the order would be, but I knew what the tunes were. But then from that and, point on... And he on, accepted that, too. He, he accepted yeah. that. And I could tell he liked the tunes, and but we didn't even write about it in advance. It was just we showed up, he was there. We played, he chose, and the record came out. End of story. End of story. There was uh, uh, so little, you know, where you have to dig into some problem and shall I play it softer or louder or is it too long? Or should that be the solo at all? Maybe it should be somebody else. And uh, we didn't do that. And this last time, the third album we did for Manfred, which was called? 
uh, Life Goes On. Life Goes On. We just finished it, and it's going to come out in a minute. And once again, we, I had the music ready. I played the music, but he chose the takes. He chose the order. He chose the whole production. I think it's just probably called production. To me, it seems like a big deal because I always had to do those things myself, you know. And now finally, I didn't have to do them anymore. I just had to play. Well, I had to write and then play, but I didn't have to worry about the artwork. So that was really an exciting stage in my life because it went from red to blue or from yeah. black to white or you, from... You, you could say is rather than was because it, it's ongoing. That's where we are now. That's right, except my latest piece has got a boys choir and a big band and we have not figured out how to... I may have to go to China to record that uh -huh. because so I need man. 30 boys and their mothers and a big band and the big band doesn't have parents but the parents I mean they have parents but they're not coming on the tour <laughs> but the boys need oh, we, we can't find a way to travel with it and the boys need their mothers uh, it just gets too big so this might be too big for ECM I may have to go to China for this one and get some ridiculously large and uh, communist regime to put it out. If they, if they believed in me, they would. <laughs> right, they would. If they were Manfred, they would, yeah. Uh, uh, we might be able to do it with Manfred, though. What's interesting to me is, uh, you know, what, what Carla's saying about the last three albums we've we've made is is true it, um, she just by by choice and and uh, and gladly and gratefully just kind of gave Manfred the dominion over over so much of what the process of making the album uh, and that turned out paradoxically to be a kind of freeing thing that allowed that allowed her to just write what she wanted and play what she wanted, which is the whole point. And I thought it was a clever thing to do because Manfred had once told me, I don't like the idea of just making records. I want to make art. I thought, wow, man. I've just been making records all my life. I want to make art too. And he, I think he succeeded more making me into a more valuable artist. Uh -huh. Okay. The records that, that we made for, for decades on our own and just simply gave them to Manfred. And, and what we gave Manfred was the the entire finished product it was not just the the playing of the music and the mixing of the recording and the mastering of the record all of the as audio aspects of it we also did all of the graphics we presented him with the booklet and the cover and it it, it was entirely done and 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 he was he was okay with that relationship for decades, um, <laughs> uh, which is kind of remarkable, given that he's a man of such uh, such strong opinions. Uh, and during that time, very often, I I I I remember taking great delight in the in the music we were playing, and kind of saying to myself, and sometimes saying to Carla too. Boy, Manfred's really going to hate this one, <laughs> and that somehow made it very exciting. And so, you know, he's always been there, if only as a target to to shoot at. You know, he's been a presence in all of the music we made, and in a way, especially the stuff we made that we just presented to him, and in which he had no direct hand. It was a good-natured hate. Oh yeah, very much so. Yeah. And that comes back to what you said earlier too, which is he enjoys a good fight. He, he, 
he's comfortable with a, a, a relationship of antagonism. I think he sees that that produces uh, interesting results. And yet, wouldn't you say it's the opposite of what I said, that I let him do whatever he wants? But it's just an exchange for him letting me do whatever I wanted. Yeah, right. <laughs>